Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week on this show, I invite a friend to join me and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Ginger, welcome to the Happy Hour. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you on the show. And um, can I confess something to you first before we get going? Go for it. This is confession time. <laughs> um, I was just telling you before we started that we're with the same publisher, but I didn't know that when your book came through my office. I didn't know who you, your publisher was with, all the things. I didn't know anything about you. You know, I was just like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, this is great. Like, um, I definitely knew who you were from your last name, your, ma your maiden name. And I literally was like, guys, I just don't know. I don't know if I, I don't know if I really want to have a conversation about whatever she's talking about. And then they were like, no, Jamie, you need to read this book. And I was like, okay, so I will. And so they gave it to me and I was like, oh, this is like Jesus. This is all about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so Ginger, I wanted to confess that because I think a lot of people will come into like, oh, what is this? What are we talking about here with someone whose maiden name is Duggar? And I just want to say up front. I am so proud of this book and I had nothing mm -hmm. to do with it, but as a friend, a new friend, we just met, but I'm like, I just, you did such mm -hmm. a great job. So I wanted to tell you that to start oh, with. Thank you so much, Jamie. That means a lot. Yeah. I know a lot of people may have assumptions about what this book is about, but I ultimately just wanted to be able to share my story. And, um, at the end of the book, I think it, and all throughout just the focus being on Christ and that's the answer. He is our only hope. You basically just like if someone reads your book and doesn't know Jesus at the end, then I they are just kind of deaf to the gospel because you gave the gospel throughout the mm -hmm. whole thing. I mean, so good. Mm -hmm. So let's dive in real quick. And I want you to introduce yourself and what you're doing right now in your life. Yeah, I'm Ginger Volo. And uh, right now I am a busy mom of two little ones. Felicity is four and Evangeline is two. And then I'm also married to my lovely husband, Jeremy. We just have a lot of fun together. He keeps me laughing. And yeah, we just love um, traveling together and eating lots of yummy food together. <laughs> I, if that doesn't sum up an awesome marriage, I don't know what does. Um, that's exactly <laughs> how my husband and I are as well. Now, you guys are also in ministry. Your husband is a college pastor. Is that right? My husband is overseeing a college ministry right now at our church, um, and it's been a huge joy to be a part of that. And we have uh, college students in our home all the time. Most mornings, um, Jeremy will be meeting with a guy or like I'll have someone come over and hang out in the day. It's really sweet. That's such a great time. I remember when I was in college um, and I had just started following Jesus and one of the pastors at our church who was kind of over the college stuff as well, kind of like you and Jeremy, the wife would just invite me into her space and she had little kids. And so mm -hmm. she would be like probably making them breakfast or folding laundry. And she just invited me in and I look back and it was one of the most formative things that happened to me mm -hmm. early in my faith. And so I'm glad that you guys are a part of that. Okay. So you released a book at the end of January. And I have it right here. It's called Becoming Free Indeed, My Story of Disentangling Faith from Fear. And um, I read this book from, well, I listened to it. So I, I should say that I listened to this book. And, I, and so I heard your voice in my ears. And I listened to this book. And I, I want to say, I want to talk about this a little bit, this disentangling. We see a lot of people this right now in our current culture who are quote what they would call deconstructing their faith. And I hear that from a lot of women who have grown up in some kind of faith circles, maybe some similar to yours, maybe not as strict as what you grew up in as well, but they just grow up and they think, what do I actually believe? And so I want you to tell mm -hmm. me, what is, do you see the difference between deconstruction and disentanglement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, as I was on this journey, walking out of um, harmful teaching, I saw so many who just abandoned the faith entirely. And that was so heartbreaking to see. And that's really the heart behind this book is why I thought, okay, I want to write this book because um, for one, I wanted to expose the teachings of this person that I had promoted for so many years. My um, it, Bill Gothard. And so 
when I was looking at it, I was like, okay, I know so many people talk about deconstruction as the only answer. They say, okay, I've been harmed within theology or a church or a person who claimed to speak for God, but didn't. And I don't know where to turn. So I'm going to turn to deconstruction, tear my faith down to the studs, never to build it up again. And it, it's just so sad that they think that's the way to go. And um, I wanted to share from my journey how I've been in this process of uh, disentangling my faith because within a lot of settings, you have some elements of truth. Like the setting I was in, I would hear the true gospel one time and then I would have this teacher coming in, adding to it and mm -hmm. saying, before you come to Jesus, you know, you need to do this to clean up your life, which is just totally opposite of the gospel of Jesus mm -hmm. um, as a gift from God. So it's like I had elements of truth mixed with error and it was the same words of God from the Bible that he was using to twist for his own gain. So it just took so much time to see, okay, how do I read the word of God? I want to come to it looking at the context of the scripture, not just pulling out a verse here and there and making it say whatever I want it to say. Mm -hmm. And that disentangling, it's, it's like if you have putty stuck in your hair and you could just shave your head to get the putty mm -hmm. out. But instead of doing that, it's a slow process of, picking the putty out of your hair, mm -hmm. keeping your hair, getting rid of the putty. And it's painful and it's hard, but that's kind of how I would explain my journey of disentanglement because it's, it's really, really tough. But I think a lot of people don't see that there is that option because mm -hmm. especially, sadly, they've been so harmed by a teacher that it's really tough for them to step foot back in a church. It's tough for them to trust anyone. Um, but at the end of the day, I can see that I don't put my confidence or trust in a person apart from the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He is the only one who will never let me down. He will never fail me. And that's where the beginning of my disentanglement journey starts. And that's where it ends yeah. is trusting in Jesus. You know, I, I find it so interesting that there really are these two roads of deconstruction or disentanglement. And we see so many people, to use your analogy, just shave the whole head. And, like, we're just going to start over and we're going to just completely abandon any of the faith. And honestly, from my humanity part, I'm like, I don't blame you. I mean, you have been so hurt and so harmed by someone claiming to be a follower of Jesus that I, I understand, even though I know Jesus is not the one that's harming them, I can see from their emotional side what would lead them to that? My question for you is you could have gone that way. I mean, you were under some harmful teaching. You have scars and bruises, I'm sure still today from that. What kept you close to Jesus? And, and I think that's my first question, but I also am very curious about your journey towards Jesus, because from what I understood from listening to your book is that you would claim to start following Jesus later in your life when I would have thought, Oh, you know, Ginger, would she have said she was a Christian since she was like seven or something? So I want to know these two things. What kept you from deconstructing and instead mm -hmm. choosing disentanglement? And I want to hear about when, what it was like for you when you said, I am now following Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it was interesting because I was raised um, in a Christian family. And so my parents did point me to the true gospel of Jesus. So I remember like praying a little prayer when I was like five, but I just did that because my sister did, and I was like kind of confused as to what I was doing. But I held to that as my profession of faith for many years. And it wasn't until the age of, well, 12, 13, I started to realize I'm not saved, but I was too embarrassed to tell anyone. Mm. And it wasn't until the age of uh, 14, whenever I was really just challenged because I, I saw how my life was going and I, I really would try to do all of these outward things mm -hmm. to be, you know, look like a good girl. And at the same time, inward, in my inward heart, I was wrestling with a lot mm -hmm. and I knew that I wasn't right with God. So at that time, I remember talking to my mom and um, just telling her like, I'm not saved. And I think for me, that was the most humbling thing um, because I think a lot of people probably thought I was, I was trying to put on this act. 
So that's when I was truly converted was at the age of 14. I cried out to God and asked him to forgive me for my sin. And just realizing my need for him at that time was, it was incredible how I was saved then. But alongside that, I was also still in this theology that was um, kind of warped my view of God. So once I was a believer, I was like, I want to know how to glorify God. How do I how do I live my life to please God? And this teacher would tell me how to do that. Bill Gothard gave us sets of rules and like, okay, you just need to read your Bible for five minutes every day, make a vow before God, never break that vow, you know, pray for five minutes every day, you know, wear these certain clothes, don't listen to this kind of music, don't date, you need a court, um, don't go into debt, have as many kids as possible. Like he would give you all the things to do to Very please works God. Based checklist yeah, like you gotta make the checklist was, exactly and um it was so interesting because i viewed those things as this is how i'm gonna please god mm-hmm. so it wasn't until um it, really my uh brother-in-law ben came on the scene i saw how his family operated a little differently than ours they kind of um like had they read the bible differently as well so they would look at the context of scripture, not just allowing a teacher to pull out a verse here and there and make it say whatever they wanted. And that was something that challenged me, but it wasn't until I met my now husband, Jeremy, and he had to go through 60 plus hours of Bill Gothard's teaching. And that's where I remembered um, for the first time being challenged with a different perspective from someone I really trusted. Mm. And he was like, I don't, you know, Bill Gothard seems to have some good things to say, but he's not a Bible teacher. Yeah. And right then I was like, what do you mean he's not a Bible teacher? Because like, that was not okay That's what you in do. my mind. Yeah. But yeah. I, I trusted, that was like my, almost like my foundation for how I would come to the Bible was through this lens. And I thought everybody needs to come into this lens to know how to please God. So um, it, as soon as I saw that these teachings weren't based in the Bible. It just, it was like a, a, an aha moment for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized, wait, if if this is not based in the Bible, I want to know what the word of God says. So going back to the Bible for myself and seeing, okay, when he says, you know, this, then I'm going to compare it with the word of God. Mm -hmm. And that's what brought me freedom. And also at that time, I mean, I had walked through, many difficult seasons in, um, in my life and all of that happening in the public eye as well, which was just another layer, but it was amazing to see how, even as a believer in that system, God was working in my heart. He was showing me more of himself. Um, even in spite of all of these teachings, he led me out of these teachings, Mm -hmm. which was the kindness and mercy of God, because I think so many people may not have the opportunity to be challenged by someone else who loves Jesus Mm -hmm. to, to examine stuff according to the Bible. And that's what Jeremy, my husband was. So he, the Lord used him in that way. So I saw, um, the beauty of Jesus in a whole new light. And that's what is so compelling and so beautiful is when you can Mm -hmm. see who Jesus is what the word of God truly says, that is what gives you confidence. That's what gives you peace in your soul Mm -hmm. and nothing can take that away. Um, So that's where I would say when I turned to Christ, it was seeing who he truly is and Mm -hmm. as a loving heavenly father, which is something I think I would miss. I had been told that sometimes, but I would never see it as such because the teachings of Bill Gothard really didn't allow you to see God as loving heavenly father. Yeah. And so it's almost like this disentangling is like, you can, you can weed through all this stuff. And at the bottom, there's Jesus, he's still there. And I think that is like, what you're saying is that was your foundation from 14 on. And so when you started detang- dis- detang- dis- disentangling that faith that you had been taught, yeah. Jesus was still there. I recently read a book by Barnabas Piper. I can't remember the name of it, but it was about church. And he said something, I'll mess up the quote, but basically he was saying like some of the best place to get healing from church hurt is within a good community. And you talk about Mm -hmm. that a little bit about on your journey of really finding a community that was helpful for you in this new journey. And I, so I know so many people are hesitant 
to find a church community when they have been hurt by some sort of church. So talk right. to us about how important that was for you mm -hmm. in this journey that you have been on. Yeah, it's interesting because I came into this church here not knowing um, much about it. Like I had a couple friends right before we moved. My husband was coming for seminary, so that's why we moved here. Um, and it was interesting walking into this world. I just started to notice that everyone was, they like look different. You know, you have different education. Um, you have people from all different kinds of backgrounds, upbringings, countries. It was just so diverse, which is beautiful because that's what's, he that's what heaven is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, part of that was my, my younger self would have looked at a church like this and judged people like real hard. Cause I would have been like, Oh, you have tattoos. Oh, you have this, or you send your kids to public school mm -hmm. and it's just not okay. But looking at everyone, the reason we're all here together, we would have no other reason to come together apart from the church coming yeah. to learn about Jesus. And that's the beauty of it. Um, we all love Jesus and want to know him more. And the church here has been such um, a, an awesome community. And I have my my closest friends who I'm so grateful for. I'm able to like be totally raw, honest about whatever I'm going through and they can pray for me and um, help me through. And that's been so amazing because I think it's, it's interesting. Like even for those who have been hurt by the church or hurt by a teacher within the church, like you said, it can be so easy to say, I'm going to just go outside of the church to find healing. But whenever you look at that, it's like, well, anyone can hurt you. And mm -hmm. so believers can sadly can, um, there have, there's been hurt in, um, difficult things that people walk through within churches, you will have the same outside of churches. And that's where I know that, um, like I said at the beginning, Jesus is the only one who will never let us down. Mm -hmm. So I, I go into any relationship remembering that, and I want to offer grace and forgiveness. Um, and I want, I hope that others would do the same for me. Um, and realizing that my hope and my trust is anchored in Jesus and who he is. And at the same time, I have to allow myself to um, find that group of people that are trustworthy, that I can open my heart to, and uh, to be a part of a community like that. It's so vital, so important. And that's new for you because you talk a lot about in the book about how when you were growing up, the teaching was just like all of the women need to be OK. You need to be happy. You need to have a smile. You need to have no expectations for your life like you are here to serve your husband. and That's it. And you talk pretty openly about when you and Jeremy were in Laredo, at the first church that he was pastoring, that it was difficult for you to let people in. It was difficult for you to really allow people to see Ginger for who she is and what she yeah. might need. How have as you've gotten older and as you've moved away from um, the teachings that you grew up in, what kind of things do you see still come up in yourself sometimes that you're like, Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I, I, I need to like lay this down. This is not right. But I mean, we can't help it sometimes with the things that have been ingrained yeah. in us. What does that look like for you today? As you try to let go of some of those things, you know, you just said like, I would have judged them in my past life or whatever. What are some mm -hmm. of the things that you still have to fight through? Yeah, I think, it is, um, even relationally, I can be very guarded because being in a public space and then also the, the side of the teaching, like you said, like always being perfect, you know, feeling like you have to like measure up and be perfect and always be happy and cheery to be, um, being light to the world or not allowing people to really see who you truly are deep down inside. That's, that's something that, um, I have seen so much growth in, and at the same time, there will, there will be days where I'll feel like I, I like, you know, can clam up and freak out like, oh no, I have to perform them. Like, no, I don't. And realizing who I am in Christ and that, um, I think it's so easy for us as women, even, um, as a whole to like, want to put on this front or be someone or be super strong and have it all together and do everything for our kids and do everything for our community. But realizing at the end of the day, it's like, no, I can't be everything for everyone. And I want to just 
how do I honor Jesus today? And looking at that and how do I really love others? If I'm totally closed off to them, it's not loving. And if I'm not um, willing to open up and share my heart with those that I trust, it's not it's not going to be healthy for me either. So those fears can creep back in. And I think the biggest fears probably are just even in my view of God, I have to still every day when I wake up, like remember the grace of God. Remember that he is my loving heavenly father because fears will always seek to creep in. Even if you weren't raised in the system I was raised in, we all have um, a tendency towards fear. And so um, I want to focus on what God's word actually says. And that's where I would say probably most of my struggles have been and and probably will be for many years um, or even into eternity, you know, like these don't just always disappear overnight, but having the truth of God's word in my mind is what will help me get through that. I, as I was reading your book, um, there was a lot that I couldn't relate to from growing up because I didn't grow up under um, that teaching that you did. But there was something that I was like, oh, this is so relatable. So um, I've been married to my husband for 21 years. And when we first got married, Ginger, my thought was like, if I'm the best wife in the world, like we will just have a great marriage. Like I will, he will be, there's no way you can find anyone better than me. I'm, I'm going to be like, I'll say yes to whatever. I'm going to be just happy and all the things because mm-hmm. I had this really big fear that one day Aaron would see another woman and he would just want to leave me and have an affair. I had a really mm-hmm. low bar, I guess, of his commitment to me, yeah. but I was so committed to being like the best mm-hmm. wife, the best wife. And that worked for a little while. It worked. And then like six or seven years in, I was like, I feel kind of miserable sometimes when I'm trying mm-hmm. so hard to be the best wife. And mm-hmm. after me kind of realizing like, oh, I don't have to do this anymore. Like our marriage has thrived so much since then. And so I want to ask you as being married and a mom to two kids, how does your marriage feel differently now? Really trusting in like the goodness of God and the grace of God and that your marriage and your happiness is not all on Ginger's shoulders. How Mm -hmm. does that feel different for you now than you would have ever imagined? It's amazing actually, because I, you talking about that, it takes me back to, I just remember um, those early years. And I, like you said, I was so agreeable. I was afraid to tell Jeremy that he did an awful job on darts. I couldn't even joke with him (laughs) because I was like, no, you're so much better than me. Like, you know, whatever. And I would like go over and above trying to tell him how amazing he is, which he is amazing. But whenever you lose at darts, it's okay to say that. And I would never have an opinion on anything because I didn't want to disagree with him. And, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy because my husband actually kindly shared with me, um, that he was like, I, I just want you to be ginger. Like who is ginger? And part of that was, I felt like I didn't know who I was. So I was always afraid and I was fearful that if I didn't perform in a certain way, like you said, he was gonna, I thought, Oh, he's going to leave me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all on me and the teachings I grew up under said that. So I had that, um, expectation that I put on myself to be someone who was always agreeable, but Mm -hmm. Jeremy, he challenged me to say, okay, like you, you can't be all of these things. And I want you to just be who you are. I don't want to push you to be anybody you're not, but who is ginger? Do you have an opinion on something? Tell me, Mm -hmm. I want to hear that. And that's part of getting closer to each other. That's part of Um, what marriage is all about is like knowing the other person. And when I'm sad, it's okay to be sad. Like, don't feel like you have to have up this front because that, like you said, will become miserable. You'll, you'll have, Mm -hmm. um, then you can't be joyful. You can't be happy when you're happy because you've had to suppress all of these feelings. So it's been a beautiful thing in marriage. I mean, we've walked through, you know, difficulty of, you know, I'm, losing, um, a pregnancy in between the girls and miscarriage. And that was really rough. And Jeremy throughout these seasons has always just been so kind and also just very servant minded of like, what can I do for you? Like, and that's how marriage is but back and forth, you know, that same way, but there's a trust in, in also realizing like, okay, I can let down my guard. I don't have to act like I'm always good. And I know that um, 
I want to be a loving wife and a joyful wife, but that's not what is going to keep him in that mm-hmm. place of, um, in us being safe in marriage, because yeah. it's not on my performance. Like you said, it's not all based on me. And that's such a freeing thing. And it's just has given me such peace and rest and confidence um, that I already knew I had in Jeremy going forward, moving into marriage, but it's only grown because I've seen him in my worst days, mm-hmm. how he's responded with such grace and love. And it's so sweet. Yeah. You know, I can see how there would be so much freedom in that, especially, I don't know a lot about um, Gothard and his teaching besides what I read in your book, honestly. Um but I can see how there'd be so much freedom, even in that specific area that we just talked about, because as a woman, the the way that the teaching was just, everything was on your shoulders and you had to do everything. And so I can imagine the freedom that would come from that. You say yes. often in your book about how you still have people, you know, that are, that are believing these teachings and following these teachings and almost living under, I'll call it, I don't think you said this, living under this curse almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what is like your hope and prayer as people read your words who might still be following in the path of this teaching? I really would pray that anyone still inside this teaching would even stop and examine these teachings because I think a lot of times you're not in that, in that setting. It's such a tight-knit community. You're afraid of losing friends. You're afraid of... Um, what may come from this if you walk away. And because Bill Gothard would say that um, if you follow his principles, Bill Gothard's principles, then your life will be a success. And if you don't, your life will be one disaster after another. Mm. And I There's believe so much that with fear, all, so much fear. Yeah, I believe that with all of my heart. Um, and that's why I think even when Jeremy said, this man's not a Bible teacher it kind of scared me. It Mm. shook me because I thought, well, now what's going to happen to me if I ever stepped outside of this, even if I don't see it in the Bible, it still took me so much time to come out of the fear of that Mm. because it's crippling. Really? Mm. You think that your life is going to be destroyed. God could take your husband or your kids because of something you feared or did Mm. just, just like rip stuff out of your hands. If you step outside this teaching. So I had to work through what is true. And I think that's something that I would hope for anyone listening, that they would see it's worth it to examine everything that you're taught according to the Bible. It's the most important thing you can do because eventually if you follow teachings that are not based in the Bible, you can get to a place where you're so confused about like, why is my life falling apart if I was Mm -hmm. promised this successful life? And realizing that we will have suffering, we'll have hardship in life. And it's it's talked about in the Bible. And um, we're not promised a perfect, easy life. And at the same time, we're promised that um, Jesus will draw near to us in those times. And he will give us grace that is sufficient for anything that he brings our way. And there's a trust and a joy knowing that as a loving heaven, Heavenly Father, he will give us what we need even if that's difficulty or pain that we'll walk through, but realizing it's not all based on, okay, I did something wrong. What is it that I did to bring this upon myself or living in this fear-based mindset will only lead you down a path that you can view God as um, evil for bringing Mm -hmm. stuff into your life. And you think it's all based on you. But when we realize the goodness of God and we realize that he is there and he'll be with us in anything, and he'll never leave us or forsake us. That's where I I would encourage anyone still in that setting just to look to Jesus and examine everything according to the Bible, because that will be what will carry you through the rest of your life. Mm. You know, as you're talking about how Bill Gothard would say, like, if you follow these principles, you'll have success. If you don't follow these th- principles, you will have like hardship in your life. To me, that sounds very cultish. Of like mm-hmm. we have this cult leader that is telling us what to do. Would you categorize that as like a like a cult leader, or am I overstepping there? No, I would definitely say it was cult like in nature. Mm-hmm. I think because of how hard it is to leave, because of the tight knit community, because of how many rules are placed upon you to gain God's favor. Anytime there's a man who claims to have some special element of truth that right. no one else has ever seen yeah. in the Bible, 
And then he has you vow before God to keep these principles that are outside of scripture. That is concerning. And that should be something that sends up warning flags. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I saw with Bill Gothard. Yeah. You know, you talk about the the hardship of leaving, the hardship of saying, I'm no longer following this teaching anymore. And you, you, you talk about the friends that you know that are still here and the pain and the like that you have for them and you, you want them to see the light and to see the truth about Jesus. Um, how has that been for you leaving this? You have a lot of family members that I would assume I have no idea are still following this teaching. How has it been for you as you have stepped away from that? You've disentangled your faith journey that you've been on. What does that look like for your relationships in your personal life? Yeah, I think I've had conversations with my family, like whether I started wearing pants um, or had little differences, I would try to share with them from the Bible why I saw it that way. And um, it's interesting. Some have responded better than others. And at the end of the day, I know um, a lot of my family could still be in this teaching, um, some of them more than others. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I knew, okay, I have to share truth. I have to speak on this topic, even though it's hard coming out against Bill Gothard's teaching is something that took me all these years to get here to where I felt strong enough and ready to share. And um, I wrote a book back in 2012 with my sisters talking about some of these principles and trying to promote this teaching. And I now see that as so harmful. So I was, mm. I wanted to kind of in a way correct it. Um, even though that was like all I ever knew, yeah. that's what I was raised in. And at the same time, I think I can see how, those still in the system can hold to that teaching because I was there. I lived that. I was probably one of the most devout thinking this is what God requires of you. So if you think that this is going to guard you from harm, that's why it would be easy to hold to that. Mm -hmm. And so I just would hope that anyone in that teaching could just stop and examine it according to the Bible and see if it stands up against the Bible, then that would that would make sense, but it just can't, it can't stand up against the Bible when you examine it with the word of God. Yeah. You were very kind and gracious to your family throughout the whole book. And I was just like, I appreciated that as well. It definitely wasn't any kind of tell all story, um, which I was, I loved because I was like, this is all about her journey and Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, Ginger, thank you so much for um, coming on the happy hour and sharing parts of your story. You guys, I did. I read this book. It's called uh, Becoming Free Indeed, My Story of Disentangling Faith from Fear and um, highly recommend it. Uh, grateful for your words. I would love to hear what are you reading these days? Yeah, I've been just in this busy season of book stuff. I've just been reading the Bible and then also I had um, a couple of, uh, sorry, a couple of, um, devotionals that I've been working through. They're like just one page and that's mm -hmm. about as much as I can do with the littles at this stage and book stuff. But, um, the word of God is always first and foremost, yeah. and then yeah. other devotionals on the sides are awesome. I so love it. those have been I a few things that I've been just um, in this season of life, but I do love audiobooks. And I told Jeremy, I said, as soon as this busy season gets by, I definitely want to jump back in and be listening to good audiobooks or have a book on the side that I'm reading. I love it so much. Audiobooks are a really good friend of mine these days as well. I listen to them in the car. I listen to them when I'm getting my lashes done. I listen to them all the time. Yes. I listened to your book yesterday for like an hour and a half while I was getting my lashes done. I was like, yeah, oh, it's so great. You can do double speed, triple speed. And yes, it's like, exactly. This is Oh Even yeah. I, I put them up really fast on those books. So yeah. and I, I say audiobooks count as reading. Some people don't. And I'm like, no, they do. yes, they I totally definitely do. think they do. Cause it would, I mean, you could waste your time elsewhere, not doing something profitable, scrolling Instagram, or you could be listening and filling your mind with good material, growing, learning through an audiobook. It is totally it so reading. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Ginger, thanks for coming on the happy hour. Thanks for having me, Jamie.